Right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, cats and kittens. Welcome to uh, Medical 110 Anatomy and Physiology. I'm your host, Dr. Garias. My apologies uh, for the late posting. It's supposed to be posted yesterday uh, night, but uh, due to an unfortunate system crash, my other Mac uh, blew up. And I uh, have to now redo this. I tried to, I tried to save it, but uh, to no avail. Looks like we're going to give Apple some more money this year. Alrighty. So what's week seven? And week seven, if you saw, I posted some notes. And the videos are nice and they're good. And uh, if you look at my notes, let's look at what are some important uh, features. of uh, the respiratory system. So as usual we always start off with uh, functions. What are the important functions of the respiratory system? First it has to have an extensive surface area for gas exchange and hence all the branching. If you look at a typical set of lungs, let's go to the respiratory system, some nice picks. If you recall, when you, uh, oh, look, Wikipedia. Wikipedia also has nice pictures, if you wish or maybe not. Hopefully we can blow up this pic. Okay, good, cool. So if we're looking at this, you can see that it, uh, it starts off at, uh, in your upper respiratory tract, which is from your trachea on up, and then you have your lower respiratory tract. And there's a lot of branching going on, and that's a lot of surface area, especially here when it gets to the terminal bronchioles, because the function of that is for uh, maximum uh, surface area for gas exchange. Now the gas exchange occurs at the level of the alveoli, which are lined with capillaries. And it makes sense uh, because capillaries are only like one cell thick, and so that um, the oxygen and carbon dioxide, which is gas exchange, go in and out of the lungs. Hence the second um, function of the respiratory system. Of course there's a frontline defense, your uh, your mucosal lining, and it's uh, apropos to what's going on now with uh, uh, COVID or SARS-CoV-2, uh, whatever you want to call it. Um, mucus, in theory, is supposed to um, protect you, but for uh, whatever reason, uh, COVID loves um, the um, uh, the inner lung lining, and hence the reason why. Uh, most people wear masks. Now, the masks aren't going to fully protect you. Remember, a virus is very, very small. So it'll go right through your skin. But at least, you know, at least it's something's better than nothing. Um, and also, uh, there's also psychological effects of wearing the mask as well. It's uh, showing others that, look, I'm, I'm, I'm protecting myself and I'm protecting you. Um, Another thing that mucus does, it's, it, it's the inner surface has to be moist. It can't be wet, and it can't be dry. And remember homeostasis, everything has to be in the middle. Protection against dehydration, of course, immune protection. There are macrophages within your lungs. Uh, macrophage, phage, meaning to eat. Macro, large. And it also serves as a uh, filtering mechanism because the mucus is nice and moist and sticky, and then it traps it and then uh, activates... Um, your cough reflex and also uh, the cilia which is these little tiny little fingers lining your uh, mucosal lining and that's the reason why you know when you start coughing uh, whatever you spit up make sure you spit it up and out and you don't swallow it um, when my kids were younger they used to do that all the time and it used to gross me out another thing that also respiratory system is very good for is that you have to be able to speak um, uh, one of those things, if you've ever seen the, um, uh, you know, those CPR videos, like the universal sign of choking 
is someone has their hands on their throat. Uh, that's the old uh, CPR stuff. That's not the universal sign of choking. Universal sign of choking is the person will not be able to talk because there's no air coming up the trachea. And if there's no air coming up your trachea or your windpipe, therefore, you won't be able to make any sound. And of course, olfactory and gustatory sensory functions do know and recall uh, that your olfactory, your smell, and your taste are, uh, are related to each other. Okay? So now, I've broken down some of these goals based on, um, um, uh, based on some, uh, some of the videos and some of the notes, and I'll, I'll show you where all those things are as well. But if we go back and we look at our respiratory system here, as I stated uh, before, the respiratory system, let's go through all the parts, is separated into an upper respiratory system and a lower respiratory system. Now, the upper respiratory system is also known as dead space, in including the trachea, because they don't really uh, do any gas exchange. They are just passageways in order uh, for the external atmospheric air to get inside. <coughs> now, it's made up of your nose and nasal uh, uh, passages, and um, these spaces in between uh, the conche. Uh, conche are like, it's like the word shell, you know, like a conch shell. So these little shells are, in my opinion, they look like little shelves. They're uh, little sections here that uh, form pathways, and uh, these pathways are called your nasal vestibules. You also have your paranasal sinuses up here, because you know when you get sinusitis, these can be filled up with fluid and pus, and that's never fun. Um, then, of course, your throat, your pharynx, and your larynx. And part of your larynx uh, here, and these are all cartilage, right? It has to be semi-rigid, but it can't be stiff. It has to be flexible. Um, your epiglottis uh, here is the trap door that prevents any food going down your uh, esophagus or food tube. So here's your epiglottis here. Let me see if it, ooh, much better, jeez. Sitting there blind. So here's your epiglottis right here, and you can see it's a trap door that closes off uh, your esophagus, um, uh, also known as your food tube. You'll also notice that your trachea or your windpipe has C-shaped cartilaginous rings. And it makes sense because the front part of the trachea has to be rigid, while the back part has to be fle more flexible because if you eat a you know eat like a bunch of nachos, it can uh, your uh, uh, your esophagus or your food tube can um, expand. And you'll notice that the trach during your trachea going into your uh, main stem bronchus right main stem bronchus left, you'll see little by little the cartilage gets replaced by smooth muscle. And remember, smooth muscle is visceral muscle. You cannot control it. Uh, it's automatic. And that's why when you get an asthma attack, you really can't, uh, you know, voluntarily tell your, uh, tell your lungs to open up. Now, this area here, this Y-shaped area here of your trachea is called your carina. And um, down here, this is your right main stem bronchus, and you see how it's shorter and fatter? So um, if there's any foreign body that gets into your trachea, God bless you, Belle. That's my daughter, Belle. Uh, uh, we're uh, COVID study buddies, and uh, um, she's also learning some of this stuff too. And um, you can see how e much easier foreign body can fall into the right lung versus the left lung. And if you see the left lung, it's a little bit more flattened out and uh, less direct. Uh, so um, foreign body uh, intrusion into your lung, you look at right lung first. You'll also notice that the right lung has one, two, three lobes. And it's separated so it compartmentalizes itself. So if it has cancer or some disease state, kind of like the Titanic, you know, uh, well, in theory, the Titanic, uh, but it did sink. But just like ships in general, they have like um, bulkheads and little rooms uh, so that it can contain all the bad things like cancer or, um, you know, uh, lower respiratory tract infection. Now, all this stuff up here is upper respiratory tract infection, if you get an upper respiratory tract infection. So 
uh, here, post-nasal drip or sinusitis, your sinuses get infected. And uh, for nose, it's rhinitis, pharynx, pharyngitis, laryngitis, you won't be able to talk. You'll have, um, you'll have a very hoarse sounding voice. Uh, but when you get down here to the level of trachea, once you have itis problems there, that's danger zone. And that's a lower respiratory tract infection. So everything from here on down, that's danger zone. And again, right lobe has how many lobes? Superior, middle, and inferior. Between the superior and the middle, there's a horizontal fissure. And between the middle and the inferior lobe, you have this oblique fissure. Now, the left lung is different because right here, you'll see a cardiac notch. This is where your heart would sit. Because remember, your heart sits a little bit more towards the left of center. And these is, this is called the apex of your lungs, this tippy top. And these are the base of your lungs. Um, and you'll notice that left lung has only an oblique fissure and, and its superior lobe and an inferior lobe. Okay. So those are the features, and of course your diaphragm, we're going to be talking about this thin shape, the muscle, uh, uh, that's very important. So um, uh, that's most of, that, those are most of the gross structures, or the really big physical structures. Now do you notice how the main stem bronchus goes from, you know, the right and the left, and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and it gets smaller until it gets to become bronchioles. At the level of bronchioles, there's more smooth muscle than... Uh, there actually there is no more at the ends here. There is no more uh, cartilage, but there is smooth muscle. Okay. Now, what's at the end of these terminal bronchioles? Well, they have alveoli, and in Latin it means bunches of grapes. These bunches of grapes or these air sacs are surrounded by um, uh, capillaries, and remember the capillaries. Are, uh, have a mixture of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood and this is the alveoli and that's already at the level of gas exchange. So all throughout here in the upper respiratory tract there's no gas exchange hence the term dead space but down here once it gets to the uh, lower and more internal levels of the heart, um, not heart, lungs then it there's gas exchange and that's where it becomes dangerous. So if you have laryngitis, pharyngitis, and, uh, you know, rhinitis, uh, are you going to the hospital? Nah. Odds are no, right? But if you have an infection that's already down here, which, by the way, COVID loves down there, right? Uh, that's where you get your bronchitis and your pneumonias and emphysema. And um, um, now... Um, um, what do you call that? Asthma is uh, the exaggerated immune response of your smooth muscle down here. That's why those of you who have asthma, all of this gets all really tight because all the smooth muscles think they're being invaded when in actuality it is just an exact, not just, but it's a serious exaggerated immune response. That's why also the exaggerated immune response of um, anaphylaxis, you know, if you have an, a severe allergy, um, it also affects your lungs and then it affects your breathing because all of this will close up, all of this will start to close up because of the inflammation. Okay? And that's the alveoli, and they're all here. They're, they're not microscopic, but they're really, really small at the ends of all of this uh, terminal bronchioles here. Okay? And that is, uh, in a nutshell, um, uh, the growth structures uh, to your respiratory system. So when you're, those of you who are making your, um, why do I call, why, why do I keep on calling mind maps? Uh, they're called, uh, but, but what are they, concept maps, concept. right? Your concept maps, can you talk about the concept of upper respiratory versus lower respiratory, right? Uh, and then you could start talking about uh, right, right, right side of your respiratory versus your left, right, and the differences. So you can see how the mind map actually helps you organize all your, um, uh, you know, all your thoughts.
And again, I just got this, just, it's like off of Wikipedia, Google it. Uh, or you can get a multitude of sources, and it's just, because lungs are lungs. All right, so let's now go to, what's the next thing? Anatomical decision, voice box, main stem, smooth muscles, uh, bronchioles, how many lobes? Oh, visceral versus parietal fluid. Um, let's look at the covering of our lungs. And that's called pleura. Do, 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 do. Look at our heart. Look at the pleura. I didn't want that. This one's. Yeah. Let's get something simple. Okay. This is better. Now, a lot of your body has coverings. Okay? So your lungs are no different. Your heart has the pericardium, and your lungs have the pleura. Now, the pleura is interesting because there are two bags or two coverings. You have your visceral pleura and your parietal pleura. Now, the word viscera or visceral means pertaining to your viscera, your guts. So that's the one that's the most inner lining. And the parietal is on the outside. So remember when you have two things to memorize, memorize one like your life depended on it, and the other one is simply the other. So now in between your visceral and parietal pleura is a pleural space. Now in that space is a small thin layer of fluid and you know the lungs are constantly moving so in order to prevent friction and uh, provide like some sort of semi-lubrication for your lungs expanding and contracting while you're breathing that's the function of the pleura. Now you could see if you get pleuritis and this gets full of blood or, or if you puncture your lung how it's gonna mess with um, uh, your capabilities of breathing. And uh, <coughs> some of us also know the term pleurisy. Uh, you know when you get a really, really bad cough and it feels like someone's running a knife down your sternum when you're coughing? Well, that's uh, pleurisy, and that's when it's st um, uh, the pleural space gets infected fluid in there, and then it starts rubbing, and that's when, um, that's where you get the pain. Okay, so uh, the pleura are the coverings of your lungs. There are two sets, your visceral and parietal. The visceral is the one closest to your lungs. The parietal is the outer tougher covering. And the pleural space is um, uh, the space in between. And it has just a little layer of fluid, just enough for uh, 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 to lubricate uh, your lungs um, as they expand and contract while you breathe. Okay, what else do we have to show you? Visceral, functional pleural, hilum, uh, we went through that, pulmonary veins, oh, the hilum, pulmonary veins and pulmonary arteries. Let's look at that. Sorry. What's the hilum of our lungs? Now, if you look at the lungs and you take them out of their um, connections. So if we look at the lung, see how it's connected like this? And the hilum is like the center connection part. So if you look at the lungs, there, there, there'd be uh, a left one here and a right one here, and they're connected. Now, in that connection, if we look here, there, ear, there are several tubes. Let's look. And it's important to know because what if your lung got ripped out for any reason, right? And also, it's good to know, like, what is going on. Oh, what's going on here? Why can't I not? Why can't I look at it? Okay, let's get something else. COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, that is a very common uh, lower respiratory tract infection. And there's two types, you have chronic bronchitis and emphysema. Now chronic bronchitis, itis, inflammation or infection of your bronchioles, and they fill up with mucus and they squeeze, so it's obvious how you can't breathe. 
Now, emphysema is a little different. Remember we, show, we showed you momentarily, or uh, momentarily, a minute ago, uh, we showed you um, the bronchioles. Now, if your bronchioles and if your alveoli get really puffy and get really big, it's just as bad as uh, your alveoli getting really, really small. Because remember, our body likes being where? In the middle. So too much space will actually dilute all the oxygen, and you won't be able to breathe. And too little space will do what? Compress the oxygen, and you still won't be able to breathe. There has to be an optimal volume of air. And actually, that's what the pulmonologists actually measure. So let's look at this. Man. I have a better picture. Okay. Okay. If we look at this, this is the hilum of your lungs, right? And that's like the, the connecting parts. Now, what you're going to get there is there's going to be parts of see if we can, there's going to be parts, and in your, um, um, in your textbooks, things are going to be labeled red and blue. And remember, they're not really red and they're not really blue. The blue just means oxygenated, and the red, I mean, the red means oxygenated, and the blue means deoxygenated. Meaning to say is, anything that's, it, they're just color conventions, so we know what's what. Um, now, the red right that means the red blood cells within that particular tube or vessel are carrying uh, oxygen and the blue means the majority of the red blood cells in that particular vessel or tube is carrying carbon dioxide now there are three things that have to go into the hilum of your lung of course there has to be a pulmonary artery and a pulmonary vein and if you recall uh, the oxygenation of your pulmonary artery and pulmonary vein it's backwards relative to the general rule so the pulmonary vein, which is coming from the lungs back to the heart, that's the red one. It goes, uh, that is oxygenated. And goes and um, the pulmonary artery that's going away from the heart and to your lungs, that is um, uh, deoxygenated. Okay? So think of it like backwards. So the three things that are in the hilum, of course, pulmonary artery, pulmonary vein, and a, and a main stem bronchus. That's, an, that's a typical anatomy, all of the above question. And that's your hilum. Now, external and internal respiration. And I believe they covered that on the videos. Just as a quick review. Respiration simply means the gas exchange between carbon dioxide and oxygen. Your body needs oxygen, then it processes it, and then it spits out, or as an exhaust, carbon dioxide. Now, um, uh, external uh, respiration simply means the way you breathe between the outside world, you know, the atmospheric pressure, and the inside of your lungs. You also have internal respiration from your lungs going into your capillaries. And then you can also you have cellular respiration that goes from uh, inside the arteries and veins into and out of um, uh, the cells of different organs. So when you think of respiration, the first thing you're always thinking of is there's different levels and it's always an exchange of oxygen for carbon dioxide. And what happens the moment you die? Are you exchanging any more gases? No. Is anything being in processed anymore? No. Uh, atmospheric pressure and internal lung pressures during expiration and inspiration. Uh, diaphragm, exocardial. Okay, this is on. Uh, this is a thing on how do you breathe. So, I think there's a video. I think there's a vi video here. Here's a nice one, but I, I, I want to show you myself on how, like the basic physics of breathing. 
and I don't want to get into the pressures because you'll get into that stuff uh, uh, later in your career. What's this? Let's see this one. The lungs. And in the lungs, you can see here we have the alveoli. And as the air comes in, I know. Air... He's going to say the same stuff that I'm saying. So let me do it this way. All right. You've got to think of it this way. Uh, when you're inhaling, remember uh, osmosis and um, um, and diffusion. Well, the law of diffusion goes like this. If you recall your week one, week two uh, lectures, everything in this world moves from a higher concentration to lower concentration, and uh, it moves through that naturally without utilizing any energy. Right, so. Right now, when you inhale, right, what are you doing when your diaphragm starts dropping and then your intercostal muscles, which are in between your ribs, move your chest up and out? It's kind of like a syringe. You're creating a negative pressure in here. And if this, if this is a negative pressure and you have a positive pressure outside, it's going to go from where? High concentration of oxygen to a low concentration of oxygen. So then you will inhale. Okay? Now, when you're in the top of the inhale and you, your lungs fill up and it can't fill up anymore, what's going to happen? You're going to have a pressure build up right here and then now this pressure is going to be more or increased versus the outside and then what's going to happen? You will exhale. So, to recap, upon inhalation, the pressures of the outside world are greater than the, pressure, the internal pressures of the lungs, so air will go in. Now, how does that work? Because your diaphragm dropped out and your intercostal muscles moved your chest up and out, kind of like a bellows, kind of like a syringe. So, it creates a negative pressure and it comes from a positive atmospheric pressure and it'll go inside. Then at the very, very top, when you, at the very, very top, you're not really breathing. That's, uh, the pressures will equalize, and then what happens? The pressure will build up in here, right? A lot of carbon dioxide, not a lot of carbon dioxide here, greater pressure here, lesser pressure out there. Then the, the person will then have to exhale. Now, all of that is created because the lungs are internal. Now, what if I took a big steak knife and put a hole right here? Then the pressures of the outside world will equal the pressures of the inside world. You'll have no pressure gradient. And then what happens? Then you won't breathe. Right? So uh, it's, you look at it that kind, that way regarding pressures and regarding how you breathe. And your main muscles of breathing is your diaphragm, which is right here, and your intercostals, which are in between your ribs. Now, if you've ever seen somebody who um, um, is um, having like a hard time breathing, they'll start hunching over and then they'll start using other muscles and those are your accessory muscles. And that's how, that's one of also the signs and symptoms how you know your patient is going through dyspnea, also known as SOB or shortness of breath. Okay, let's see if we went through everything, pulmonary artery and veins, atmospheric pressure, how you breathe, which muscles, diaphragm, internal and external intercostal muscles. We went through that. Accessory muscles, you can look that up. When do you use them? You use them when you're in dyspnea, and you use them when you're in trouble. So I believe the actual notes have some, uh, some more pictures um, because I don't have my um, Microsoft Word loaded up on this particular computer. So that's it for uh, the lecture proper. Now let's look at some week seven items that you might have some inquiry on. And again, another public service announcement. Please, 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 uh, you really need to register. Okay? And you have to do it now. This is week seven. Registration started week five. So if you have any student account holds or any holds of that matter, if I didn't email you yet, you should be emailing me, especially if you're health science uh, and you're um, already through the process of applying to a school of nursing. So please don't wait on that stuff. Uh, please look at your emails. 
uh, daily, at least twice daily. Um, uh oh, internet froze. Okay, so let's look at task seven, which is of course what? What do we always do? Wash, rinse, and repeat. We always do our. Um, why do I keep on calling it mind map? Concept map. Thank you, Bill. So you look at uh, these videos and 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 look at and do you have Carolina notes here. These are nice. You know I'm always a fan of Carolina notes, right? Um, oh, energy. This is also part of the reason why we have to suck in oxygen all the time. Remember those. Little uh, guys, mitochondria within cells, what are the two things that they eat? They eat oxygen and glucose. So you have to breathe and you have to eat a sandwich, right? So the oxygen and glucose get together and make ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate. The phosphate bonds in ATP are high energy bonds and they're utilized in almost every biochemical process in your body. So if you're not breathing, you're not maximizing your strength and your energy. Uh, um, those of you who had me before, I always used to make a joke of a lot of guys in the gym who do a lot of screaming and a lot of stuff, but they don't breathe. And if you've ever seen a guy try to press way too much or uh, um, uh, try to deadlift way too much without breathing, you'll see them fall down very easy because why? There's no, there's no oxygen creating ATP. The ATP doesn't activate uh, uh, the muscle fibers, muscle fibers won't activate, you won't able to be able to do the job. Okay, now structure of the respiratory system, we went over respiratory gas exchange, how does that work? And oxygen and carbon dioxide, how does it get in and out of the lungs? Okay, so um, your concept map should have what? Three chunks of, of, uh, of drawings in it. Some of you even have three pages of drawings. All right. Okay. Um, what's the discussion for week seven? Again, do week eight? Well, relatively do week eight. Uh, but please, please do not take advantage of my kindness because at the end of the day, if it goes, grades have to be submitted week 10. And, you know, uh, by the Saturday, Sunday morning of week 10, uh, is my job to write down whatever is going on. So if you're behind, please, please, please uh, get in contact with me. If you've got zeros, start tackling them. Make a plan um, um, and make sure it's a daily plan. Doing this thing like, um, uh, because I've see, I see many of you, when you log in, you log in like one specific day. Please don't do that. Log in every day and do stuff every day. So let's look at the discussion. Remember, at least 200 words, APA cited format. If not, I have to chop points. Uh, I hate doing that, and it's and it's a skill set you will definitely need. And I'm telling you, especially your English and your humanities professors, and especially nursing, they're gonna be way more sticklers than I am. So please get used to the process of, uh, of posting regularly um, and uh, of putting um, uh, putting data and put, uh, um, uh, putting good citations. So technology, okay, I see some people already submitted. Remember, right, um, um, uh, telehealth and, um, and uh, also talking to your doctor now on Skype or Zoom or whatever, uh, because of the quarantine, it is now commonplace. Actually, uh, my wife works as a healthcare administrator at uh, Inova, and uh, she works at home and she's in the office. Um, um, down the hall uh, for me right here at the, the Garias family bunker and um, all I hear is would you like to have it goes would you like to have an online appointment what kind of online appointment it's commonplace now uh, um, especially with all the social distancing social distancing protocols that we have okay so there's a lot of things you could talk about and remember if we're talking about technology, uh, I need to see citations from this year, from 2020, 2019 at the latest. Because think about it, what your phone did last year is nothing what it what it's compared to what it can do now. Okay, 
So let, lastly, let's talk about the lesson, and odds are it's a case. So let's look at uh, lesson seven. Remember, uh, including, this, uh, including this week, three more weeks left uh, in the term. So please, please, please get caught up. So let's look at lesson seven. And utilize Google, utilize our databases. Um, I have some students saying, oh, I read the case twice and I still don't get it. Then, then Google an answer, all right? Here's some more. Uh, now, again, we're not going to do a, a lab or respiratory physiology, but, uh, you know, uh, you look over it. But, again, like always, you click on the case. Then um, uh, there's a little box in the upper right-hand corner that says download the case, which is right here. We look at the case. Buffalo University. Uh, I did some postgraduate work there. Lovely, uh, a lovely chemistry department, but cold as fudge. Um, part one, symptoms. So you read uh, case in cell, uh, cellular respiration. Okay? Answer these questions. All right? And they're, they're very straightforward layperson questions. Then the autopsy report. Okay? And then part three. All right? Uh, you know what? Do part one and two. Because we're not biochemists. I'm not going to talk about acetylcholine. Parts one and two only. Okay? And that's for um, the case for week seven. All right. With that being said, that is all the news that is good news. And again, register, register, register. Or give me a call. If you don't know how, do not wait. Okay? Uh, um, how many times I could just get a quick email? And then you quickly answer a couple of questions and we can get you registered. There is also these live sessions, so uh, these Zoom sessions that are going on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday with Dr. Tampa and other um, uh, health science uh, advisors. And I think I'm doing Friday at 11 o'clock or something like that. Okay? So uh, please, please, please uh, do what you need to do. Ace this class. And I will see you guys next week. Have a good one.